Hello, Great Church. Thank you for joining me for episode three of Your Day Investments. They were talking about two different kinds of clerical clothing or other kinds of clothing you might see at Grace Church. One is clerical streetwear. Um, this is something that the a priest will wear um, when not performing uh, a service, but performing other pastoral duties. Um, and I'll point out here that this is not typically a vestment, so it's not worn during the service. Um, but here we see Father Jonathan wearing his clerical streetwear. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you his peace. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. We'll also look at choir dress. And this is uh, two kinds of dress. One that the choir wears in the ancient chests. And we, we see a, a photo of the choir wearing their choir robes here. This also refers to the kind of attire that a priest may wear when performing a service that's not Eucharistic, like as, uh, for example, evening prayer. During this episode, we'll, we'll be considering several questions. Among these questions will be, why do priests in many Christian traditions, especially the Anglican, Catholic, Lutheran, and Orthodox churches, usually dress in black? And here I'm referring to the black of clerical streetwear. What does the color of clerical streetwear have to do with graduation robes and the robes that judges wear in many countries? And why are business suits in the vehicles and presidential motor motorcades also usually black? And I'll explain how all of these questions are interrelated as we move through the video. But before we dive into talking about clerical streetwear and, cho and choir dress, I want to think about ornamentation of liturgical vestments. And this will help us think about why the color black is so prominent in clerical streetwear. So now I want to think about how the vestments we see the clergy wearing during a Sunday service, vestments like the chasuble that I talked about last time, became so elaborate. Here we see our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, wearing a chasuble which, by early church standards, would have been considered quite ornate. And here's our own bishop nicely, also wearing elaborate vestments. But this wasn't always the case. Here we see a 6th century mosaic from the chancel of the Church of San Vitale in Ravenna, Italy. In the center we see Justinian, who is emperor of the eastern half of the Roman Empire from 527 to 565. He's robed in purple, the color of emperors in ancient Rome. He's joined by some of the most powerful men in his empire. The mosaic is meant to establish the emperor's central authority between the church the imperial administration, and the military. To the emperor's right, we can see two imperial administrators indicated by the purple stripe, followed by a few soldiers. There's also an administrator standing just behind the emperor to his left. To the emperor's left, we can see the Bishop of Ravenna, Maximianus, accompanied by two deacons. Bishop's chasuble is quite austere by our modern standards. It's olive in color with only a small black cross and fringed edges for ornamentation. In contrast, the sacred objects carried by the clergy, the golden gem studded cross in the bishop's hand and the bejeweled golden gospel book are quite ornate. Over the past couple episodes in this series, I hope that I've been successful in making the point that vestments are not just about aesthetics. What I find most interesting about vestments, really any kind of clothing, is that they're meant to make a statement. This use of symbolism was particularly powerful in the ancient and medieval worlds. This statement went in two directions. 
First, it's a statement about the wearer's authority and role within society. In the case of vestments, it's also a statement about the sanctity of the priesthood. Second, and this is especially true of liturgical vestments, it's a statement meant to remind the wearer of the gravity of that authority and role within society. As liturgical vestments developed in the early and medieval church, they came gradually to serve as reminders to the priests of the importance of their piety in their service toward the church. Fellow medieval historian Maureen Miller uses the term in clothed cognition to describe the use of clothing to remind the wearer of their duty. In the vesting prayers that I talked about in previous episodes, we're meant to solidify this connection between the sacred priesthood and the physical vestments. In the late 8th and early 9th centuries, these statements were at the center of the conversation about what priests should wear. Around that time, there's evidence pointing to the emergence of gold ornamented vestments woven with precious silks. This kind of ornamentation most likely began in Anglo-Saxon England or in the northwestern part of present-day France. In the Carolingian Empire, which occupied present-day France in addition to northern Italy and western Germany, this ornamented style was embraced from about the 820s. It was embraced because bishops in the empire were beginning to be seen less as servants of the church and empire, and more as political and spiritual collaborators within the imperial court. Bishops sought to share authority in exercising the ministerium, the care of salvation of their flock, with the emperor. And so many of them sought to share in visual displays of imperial splendor. At the time, theologians were offering a spiritual rationale for this ornamentation drawing from the Old Testament, which described Aaron's elaborate vestments. One such passage appears in Exodus, where it says, gold and hyacinth and purple and scarlet twice dyed and fine twisted linen embraced with diverse colors. But even with the spiritual rationale, the shift toward an ornamental style for the vestments of bishops and eventually ordinary priests was not without controversy. In fact, it's in the 12th century when ornate vestments appear to have become the norm in Europe. This is the time when church inventories are full of references to gold embellished and precious silk vestments. That we've seen increased interest in what priests could wear outside the sanctuary. It's possible, as the historian Maureen Miller suggests, that restrictions about what priests could wear outside the sanctuary were meant to protect their ability to wear embellished vestments inside the sanctuary. So at this point, we started to see increased efforts on the part of the church to regulate clerical streetwear. Several centuries earlier, canons regarding clerical streetwear were pretty vague. Essentially, they just said that a priest must wear a priestly tunic, with little description of what that meant. But now we hear that, clothing, that the clothing a priest wears in public must be modest and dark. Usually this means a kappa clausa, a kind of closed cloak. Because students were considered members of the clergy in the early years of, of medieval universities, this kappa clausa that they wore is the ancestor of the modern graduation robe. Also, since many of these clerical students went on to become lawyers and judges, the kappa clausa is also the ancestor of the judicial robes seen in many countries. I wanna pause here and think about the importance of this requirement for dark clothing. In many cases, dark would be interpreted as black. The color black had, for several centuries, been associated with sanctity and virtue. Beginning in the ninth century, monks were increasingly associated with the color black, this being the common color of Benedictine habits. This was often contrasted against the colorful clothing flaunted by the wealthy and their retinue, even some clergy. This clothing was considered showy, unrestrained, and even sinful. But when parish priests and other uncloistered priests were also required to wear black, or at least dark clothing, this had a pretty significant influence on the visual culture of clothing, particularly in urban areas where you would more likely see a higher concentration of clergy. Eventually, nobles and merchants began to also adopt black as a sign of their own virtue, respectability, and morality, as a sign of measured authority. At the time, there's a lot of uneasiness about the growing economy of medieval Europe. Black clothing was a way to signal the merchant's virtue. So jumping ahead to the 16th century, 
It makes sense that Cosimo de' Medici, the Florentine duke and heir of a banking fortune, would sit for a portrait dressed in stark black. Given this historical association of black with virtue, respectability, and morality is a sign of measured restraint, we can now make sense of the fact that black business suits and the black vehicles of a presidential motorcade continue to at least attempt to signal virtue, restraint, and respectability. So this association with black began in the clergy, it was adopted by the wealthy and powerful as a, as a similar signal of virtue. So that explains the simple black attire worn by priests today, but where does the collar come from? Well, by the 15th century, wealthy laymen's attire in Europe commonly included linen collars and scarves folded over jacket collars. This would protect them from daily wear and soil. At the time, the clergy would, would often wear similar collars under their clerical garb. This became a widely accepted custom in both lay and clerical circles. By the 17th century, there were many forms of this linen collar, many of them made of ornate and expensive lace. But in 1624, Pope Urban VIII regulated the use of the collar and proclaimed that any ornamentation or lace was forbidden for clergy. As the years progressed, different variations of the, of the clerical collar were developed across different Christian denominations. In terms of the modern clerical collar, one theory is that a Scottish Presbyterian minister invented the collar, and it was further popularized in the Anglican Church by the Oxford movement of the time. The collar was eventually adopted by other Christian denominations. The collar would originally be attached to the cassock, a long black robe worn by many clerics since about the 16th century. The cassock has been less common since the 1960s, but is still occasionally worn by Anglican and Catholic clergy. Here we see Bishop Nicely wearing the purple bishop's cassock. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. The cassock is also worn by the choir and lay liturgical ministers during worship services. I'll discuss this in more detail shortly. Today, of course, not all clergy in the Episcopal Church wear black clericals or purple for bishops. The Episcopal Church invites clergy to wear clericals of really any color. Here we see our own mother, Levon, wearing a blue clerical. Turning now to choir robes, churches often use choir robes to give a sense of aesthetic uniformity, but also to focus people's attention not on what choir members are wearing, but on what they are singing. Like clerical streetwear, choir dress is also not considered vestment because it is not worn by a priest while celebrating the Eucharist. You'll notice that the youngest choir members, the choristers, are distinguished by a ruffed collar. This collar was popular in Europe from about the mid-16th to the mid-17th centuries, a formative period for the Church of England. Here we see Sir Francis Walsingham, secretary and spy master to Queen Elizabeth I, wearing a ruffed collar. In the Lutheran Church of Denmark, priests commonly wear the ruffed collar as their clerical collar, this here is the current Bishop of Copenhagen. Aside from the ruffed collar worn by choristers, choir robes consist of two parts. The cassock, which is derived from the clerical cassock I just described, with the exception that it is usually colored, at grace our choir wears red, and the surplice. Surplice comes from the late Latin superpelicaeum, meaning something you put over your fur garment. The earliest evidence for the surplus comes from the early 11th century. As the name suggests, people would often wear thick fur clothing to worship services to protect themselves against the cold. And a surplus originated as a dresser layer that you could put over this fur. Church organists tend to wear a modified version of the regular choir robe. Here we have our associate director of music, David Hines wearing his organist's robe. You'll see that the sleeves are cut to allow freedom of movement of the hands. This is important for both playing the organ and conducting the choir. In non-Eucharistic services, 
organists may also wear an academic hood. In many Western countries, and those whose university traditions are influenced by the West, graduates wear hoods which signify the level of their academic degree, the university they attended, in their academic discipline. Here we see Davids wearing his hood, indicating that he received a Master of Music. It's a black corded silk lined with dark cherry satin. The hood is from the University of Cambridge, which does not indicate the school by the hood's color, but rather in its shape. The robes worn by lay liturgical servers, such as the crucifer, chalice bearers, and torch bearers, are similar to those worn by the choir, with the exception of the black cassock instead of the red. I mentioned earlier that choir dress also refers to the attire worn by the clergy during public prayer services when presiding over a non-Eucharistic worship service like Evensong. Here we see Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury, in choir dress when meeting with Queen Elizabeth. And here we see Bishop Michael Curry in choir dress, delivering his sermon at the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. You'll notice that clerical choir dress consists of the cassock, on top of that a rocher for bishops or a surplice for priests. The rocher is a it's similar to the surplus, except that the sleeves are narrower and are often secured with cuffs. Over the rocher, bishops will wear a shamir, this red vest-looking garment. Lastly, the choir dress consists of a tippet, a kind of scarf similar to the stole. Here we see Father Jonathan's tippet, which contains the coat of arms of General Theological Seminary on the left. This is where he received his final degree. And on the right, the coat of arms of the Anglican Communion. Thank you for joining me as I explore clerical streetwear and choir dress. I hope you'll join me again next week.